There we go. All right, let's open our Bibles this evening to the book of Acts. Chapter 8 and verse 13. Acts chapter 8 and verse 13. This is uh, the chapter that highlights the ministry of Philip, the deacon, who was also an evangelist. And he has a, min he has a twofold ministry here in, in chapter 8. The first part of his ministry is in Samaria. And then later, he's going to minister in Judea. So we're still in the section where he's ministering in Samaria. There's where Samaria is. And he has come into Samaria as an evangelist. And his evangelistic activities have led a lot of Samaritans to the Lord, including, as we're going to see tonight, a man named Simon, who prior to his salvation was involved in, you know, magic arts and things like that, and was sort of promoting himself as someone great amongst the Samaritans. If you look back at verse um, 11, you'll notice the words long time. He had Simon for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. So those that had originally been impressed by um, Simon start getting saved. And then we come to Acts chapter eight, verse 13. And what happened to Simon? It says in verse 13, even Simon himself believed. So Simon exercises faith in Philip's message. Uh, Philip's message, I think, is very, very sound because he describes, it describes his message back in verse 12 about the name of Jesus Christ. So I'm of the persuasion that, that Simon was really what I would call an authentic believer. And, and what I just said is, is very disputed. And we'll get into why that is uh, this evening. But you'll notice that Simon himself believed now that's the same word used to describe the Samaritans in verse 12 that believed. And nobody doubts the salvation of the Samaritans. So why, why, why is it that the same word used to describe Simon and his salvation, everyone doubts? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll show you why people doubt it in just a minute. So why was Simon saved? He believed, just like the rest of the Samaritans. He fulfilled the condition. Uh, Lewis Berry Chafer says, upwards of 150 passages of scripture condition salvation upon believing only. Believe means to trust. He trusted in the message of Philip, which is all about Jesus Christ. So those are some of the classic verses that you can look at that teach there's only one condition necessary to be justified before God, that's to believe. Genesis 15, six, then he, Abram, believed in the Lord and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. John 3, 16, which you already know well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then another classic is Acts 16, 30 through 31, where the Philippian jailer asks, sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
and they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. So the Bible, uh, over 150 times, lays this out as the only condition the lost sinner must meet. Believe, as you know, is more than just intellectual assent. It has to do with trust. So Simon met the condition, as did the rest of the Samaritans. And then you'll also notice that Simon was baptized. Uh, There in verse 13, it says, even Simon himself believed after being baptized and after being baptized. So he believed, and then he was baptized. Just like the rest of the Samaritans. If you go back to verse 12, it says, but when they believed Philip preaching this good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. So the Samaritans believed and were baptized, the exact same thing happened to Simon. He believed and was baptized. Now, who was doing the baptizing? It was Philip. Philip the deacon, Philip the evangelist. And you have to ask yourself at some point if Simon's salvation was somehow in doubt, why would Philip have baptized him? Well, because Philip apparently had no reservations about Simon's uh, newfound faith. And so we baptized Simon along with the rest of the Samaritans. A third reason why I think Simon was saved is if you go down to verse 24, after Peter is going to rebuke Simon, Simon experienced remorse. It says in verse 24 of Acts 8, Simon answered and said, pray to the Lord for me yourselves so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. So he seems to feel sorry for trying to grab the reins of power, which he does uh, in between his salvation and his remorse. So the fact that he's experiencing remorse is evident that the Holy Spirit is inside of him working. I mean, I don't think he would have experienced that kind of remorse without the Holy Spirit inside of him. So that's um, what Chafer called a secondary evidence of the assurance of salvation. The primary evidence is the promise of God. When you believe, God makes you a promise that you're saved. If you believe on, in, you know, on Jesus Christ the true message of Jesus Christ. You're saved, God promises it. But then you'll notice that after you do get saved, you start to have certain experiences that you didn't have prior to salvation. So you'll commit a certain sin that you used to commit regularly, except now you feel really bad about it. So what happened to you? The Holy Spirit came inside of you and started to make you sensitive to particular sins that you really had no sensitivity towards before salvation. So that's sort of a secondary evidence as to how you can know you're saved. But subjective experiences you wanna hold on to somewhat loosely because they can come and go. The primary evidence that you have that you're saved is the promise of God who cannot lie. If you believe on my son, God makes you a reciprocal promise that you're saved, you've passed, crossed over from death to life. So when you look at this man named Simon, a sorcerer, to me he looks like he's saved. Because what's happening in his life is exactly what happened in the lives of the Samaritans in verse 12, whose salvation no one contests. Number one, Simon believed, just like the Samaritans. He didn't just believe, but he believed in the right thing. Because faith is only as good as the object it's placed in. And you see Philip's bold proclamation of Christ in verse 12. That's the message that the Samaritans trusted in. That's the message that Simon trusted in. Number two, Simon was baptized, just like the Samaritans. Baptism doesn't save you, of course. 
<clears throat> it's an outward confession of an inward reality. That's what baptism is. But it's highly unlikely that Philip would have baptized Simon with the rest of the Samaritans if Philip somehow had doubts about Simon's salvation. And then number three, Simon had a, a subjective experience, which is not your primary evidence that you're saved, but it can be a secondary evidence. When confronted by Peter, he experienced remorse, verse 24, which indicates that the Holy Spirit was inside of him, sensitizing him to the need to live you know, a holy life. So I remember when I first got saved, uh, as some time passed, I started to have desires that I never had before. One of those desires was to read, to read my Bible and to read books about Christianity and the, the things of, that are eternal. So I never had that desire before salvation. Um, in fact, getting me to read anything <laughs> before salvation was a work in and of itself. I'm not even sure how I graduated high school, to be honest with you, because I didn't read anything. Um, I majored in basketball was part of the problem. Um, but, but after salvation, it's so interesting how you can walk into a Christian bookstore and just have a desire to read this, a desire to read that, something I never had before. So in addition to the promise of God that I was saved, God was giving me sort of an accompanying secondary experience uh, demonstrating that I was saved. The same, the same kind of thing has happened in the life of Simon. So you would think that we would just move on from this verse, right? If you were in a, a normal church, you would move on from this verse. But you're not in a normal church. <laughs> you're in a church that goes, goes deeper or deep into the things of God. And so I want to explain to you why the vast majority of commentators out there do not believe Simon was saved. They think that his faith was uh, spurious, they call it. So this happens from the Arminian perspective. Maybe he was saved and lost his salvation. It happens from, largely from the Calvinistic perspective that teaches if you're saved, you have to bear fruit. And if you're not a fruit bearer, then we, they have a right to question whether you were saved to begin with. Um, in Simon's immediate post-Christian life, and keep in mind, he didn't have a lot of time to mature, there's not a lot of fruit here. There's maybe some in his um, remorse in verse 24, but he does some really naughty things as a so-called believer. And so people um, coming from the Calvinistic persuasion, say he's not bearing fruit, so his faith is illegitimate. So let me give you the seven arguments that you'll run into over and over again when teachers or commentators question Simon's salvation. I've given you the three reasons why I think he was saved, but why do so many people challenge this? Basically seven reasons. Um, the first is they believe that his faith was what they call spurious. Notice this quote from William <coughs> Hendrickson, a Calvinist. He writes, many, now he's commenting on John 2, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Many trusted in his name because of the manner in which his power was displayed. They accepted him, Jesus, as a great prophet and perhaps even as the Messiah. This, however, is not the same as saying they surrendered their hearts to him. Not all faith is saving faith, close quote. Look at that last clause that I have underlined. Not all faith is saving faith. Well, then what's saving faith? He mentions surrender. 
Uh, you can memorize this through the mnemonic uh, COPS. You have to have commitment, you have to have obedience, you have to have perseverance, and you have to have service. COPS, commitment, obedience, perseverance, service, and you better have it fast, and if you don't have it fast, then you don't have the real faith. You have a fake faith. Because not all faith is saving faith. There's the faith that saves and there's the faith that doesn't save. And I can't tell you how many Christians labor under this doctrine. And I say labor because if you believe that last clause, not all faith, all faith is saving faith, you know what just got thrown right out the window? The assurance of salvation. Because you're gonna spend your whole life as a Christian wondering if you've got the right kind of faith. Because Hendrickson said there's two kinds. There's the faith that saves and the faith that doesn't save. The faith that doesn't save, they call easy believism. The truth of the matter, folks, is in the Bible, you'll never find the expression easy believism. It's made up. You either believe or you don't. It's that simple. It's like getting on an airplane. I'm either going to get on the plane, trust the pilot, and get on the plane, or I'm not. Now, I might get on the plane with sweaty palms being nervous, but I'm still on the plane. I'm either in or out. And that's how the Bible presents salvation. You either, you either believe or you don't. This idea of easy believism is, is basically made up. But Hendrickson and others would say that Simon didn't have the right kind of faith. And a lot of this relates to the gift of faith that the elect receive in Calvinism. God has ordained a certain small fraction of the human race unto salvation. Everyone else, according to John Calvin himself, is doomed from the womb. They're unsavable. And since no human being has the ability to believe in Christ, they say, God has to impart the gift of faith to the elect. So if you happen to have the right kind of faith, faith accompanied by cops, commitment, obedience, perseverance, and service, then you probably have the gift of faith, but you really don't know because in the course of your life, you might lapse into unbelief. So you really have to wait till the very end of your life to know whether you're one of the elect or not. And that's why so many of the Puritans who believe this, there was a doctoral dissertation written on this, went to their graves, uh, their deathbed, I should say, in total fear because they didn't really know if they were one of the elect, had the right kind of faith, the gift of faith, because how would you know until you get to the end of your life whether you've persevered or not? So commitment, obedience, perseverance, and service, I mean, those are very subjective. How much commitment do you have to have? How much obedience? How much perseverance? How much do you have to serve? Those are never objectively quantified. And so people that believe this, the two faiths doctrine, the faith that saves and the faith that doesn't save, uh, they don't have any assurance of salvation. It's, it's very sad to see how many Christians have been seduced by this. So what the first argument that people give is Simon didn't have the right kind of faith. He had spurious faith. And it's at this point that they'll run you right through James 2, verse 19. Every legalist I've ever run into runs you through James 2, 19. And James there says, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons believe and shudder. So looky there, you, even the demons believe and they're not saved. And they'll run you through the parable of the sower. Luke 8, verse 13. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm going to give you their arguments first. There's seven of them. Then I'm going to come back and answer their seven arguments. 
They'll run you through Luke 8, verse 13, where it says those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and they have no firm root, and they believe for a while, and in time of temptation fall away. So they'll use James 2, verse 13, uh, verse 19, excuse me, Luke chapter 8, verse 13, to argue for this spurious faith idea. There's the faith that saved and, and the faith that doesn't save. And they try to defend the faith that doesn't save from the parable of the sower, those that believed and fell away. And from James 2, verse 19, even the demons believe and tremble. So that's the first reason people don't think Simon's faith was legitimate even though his conversion is described the exact same way as everyone else's conversion in Samaria. The second argument that they use is they say Simon had miracle faith. Miracle faith. Spurious faith, miracle faith. In other words, he was just interested in miracles. And their favorite passage for this is John 2, verses 23 through 25. That's the passage that Hendrickson was quoting earlier or alluding to. It says this, now, when he was in Jerusalem, that's Jesus, at Passover during the feast, many believed in his name. And the construction there is pastuo ace, believed in, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men, because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. So there there are people that believed in Jesus in John 2, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them. And that's taken as they didn't have authentic faith. They had miracle faith, but not saving faith. They just believed in his miracles. Now, they're abusing the passage, as I'll show you a little bit later, but that's the second argument that they use. And they make a big deal about how in the second part of verse 13, it says of Simon, he continued on with Philip and he observed the signs and the great miracles taking place and he was constantly amazed. Oh, he had miracle faith, spurious faith, but not the real faith. He never received the gift of faith, which is always accompanied by a desire for commitment, obedience, perseverance, and service. The third argument that you'll run into as to why people don't think Simon was saved is he's told to repent. Look at verse 22 of Acts 8. Peter speaking to Simon, therefore repent of this wickedness of yours and pray that if possible the intention of your heart may be forgiven of you. He's trying to purchase the the power of the Holy Spirit here. And Peter says you need to repent And basically what they'll say is the word repent only applies to unsaved people. They'll quote Acts 2 verse 38 where Peter is speaking to the unsaved on the day of Pentecost. Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They'll run over to Paul on Mars Hill in Acts 17 who applies the word repentance to the unsaved. Paul there says to the unsaved, therefore having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. So they'll say repentance only applies to an unsaved person. Simon is told to repent, so he must must have uh, not had the real faith. Peter, in, in his epistle, 2 Peter 3, 9, says the Lord, Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, 
but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So repentance only applies to unsaved. So obviously Simon is unsaved, didn't have the real faith because he's told to repent. That's the logic. Um, The fourth argument that you'll run into as to why Simon was allegedly unsaved because he just had spurious faith is the word perish, verse 20. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. And so they'll say, well, there's the word perish. Peter says, may your silver perish with you. Which is kind of an interesting question. How does silver perish? I mean, they don't really, these are questions they don't bring up. The side of the ledger, the side of the argument. So they'll run over to John 3, verse 16, um, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Peter said, May your silver perish with you. And because perish, John chapter 3, verse 16, is applied to unsaved people, Simon was unsaved. And then they'll run down to verses 21 and 23 where Peter rebukes Simon and they'll say the process of the rebuke, it obviously describes an unsaved man. And I'll I'll, I'll, uh, concede that it is a harsh rebuke. Peter rebuking Simon because he thought he could buy the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter says to Simon, you have no part or portion in this matter for your heart is not right before God. Verse 23, I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. And they'll say, see, that's bondage of iniquity. Have no part, all these kinds of things. Your heart's not right. Uh, Obviously, you're dealing with an unsaved person. And then they'll say, this is number six, um, Luke never says Simon received the Holy Spirit. Um, Because it says in verses 17 and 18, concerning the Samaritans, then they began laying their hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. And we're gonna get into, which I don't have time to do tonight, why the Samaritans got the Holy Spirit at a later point after believing. There's a reason for that. It has to do with the Jewish-Samaritan conflict. But very clearly, even though the Spirit is delayed, the Samaritans received it. And it says in verse 18, now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. So they'll make a point about how, it talks about how all these Samaritans received the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't say Simon received the Holy Spirit. Now notice it doesn't say Simon didn't receive the Holy Spirit either. (laughs) So it's kind of an argument from silence that they use. And then a, a seventh argument that you'll run into is they will trace Simon to Gnosticism, which started to get developed uh, end of the first century into second century. So Henry Morris, um, a commentator that I really like on almost everything, but not this, And I think the brother quoted that, I think, last week. Yeah, that's why I included this. Henry Morris writes, Simon's belief was evidently only a belief in the reality of signs and wonders performed by Philip. Note Christ's rebuke of this kind of belief in John 2, 23 through 25. We had that on the screen earlier. So Henry Morris is saying Simon had miracle faith but not saving faith. These wonders were greater than those which Simon was able to do with sorcery, 
and he was envious, wanting to purchase the power of the Holy Spirit. In, now, this last sentence, in early Christian literature, he was called Simon Magus, and he was said to be a prominent enemy of the true faith. So in later Christian literature, a lot of people believe Simon went on. He obviously didn't persevere in the faith because he had some kind of role in starting Gnosticism. So you take those seven arguments and you put them together and almost every commentator you read comes to the conclusion that Simon was never really saved. Even though the Bible says he believed, was baptized, and experienced remorse. So let me give you what I think are the answers to these seven arguments. Why do I think Simon had authentic faith? Well, the first argument, his faith was spurious. James 2.18. Excuse me, James 2, 19. The demons believe and tremble. When someone brings up that passage, they're, they're comparing apples and oranges. Salvation is not open to the demons. Salvation is not open to the fallen angelic realm. And so when you bring in, well, the demons believe too and they tremble, and almost everybody does this, they're, they're bringing in an issue where salvation isn't even applicable to the demons. We're not, de we're not dealing with demons here. We're dealing with a human being. Salvation is open to humans. It's not open to fallen angels. So they're putting two things together that don't even belong. And uh, also in James 2 verse 19, the gospel is not presented the name Jesus is not found in James 2, verse 19, specifically. All it says is you believe God is one. That's a belief in monotheism. That's not the gospel. No one is saved by believing God is one. You do well, also the demons believe and shudder. So, <laughs> Acts 8, Jesus is mentioned. James 2, Jesus is not mentioned. Acts 8, human salvation. James 2, demonic salvation, which isn't even a possibility. James 2, verse 19, the only thing it's talking about is our faith needs to become productive so God can use it. And James, to get the point across, says that's even true with the demons. The demons believe in God and they have a reaction. They're afraid. So since that happens amongst the demons, how much more should it happen amongst God's people who believe the truth? If there's a demonic reaction to demonic faith, a trembling, in order for our faith to be productive and useful, we need to apply it. So he's sort of arguing from absurdity is what he's doing. But people grab that James 2 verse 19 passage all the time and argue for this spurious faith idea. And in the process, they're equating two things that don't go together. And then they go over to the parable of the sower. Luke 8, verse 13, those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and they have no firm root, and they believe for a while, and in a time of temptation fall away. Now, what they're assuming is all of the different soils, as the gospel is preached and the seed is planted on different soils, and only in one soil does it bear fruit. They're assuming that the only people saved in that parable is the soil bearing fruit. Everyone else is unsaved. I want to give you a different interpretation of the parable of the sower. 
in three of four cases, salvation's happened. In one case, salvation does not happen. So you might want to just go over there, Luke 8, verses 5 through 8. And you know this, this parable well. It says, The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road. And it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocky soil. As soon as it grew up, so it sprouted, there was life there. It withered away because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, now watch this, and grew up with it and choked it out. So there's life there again, but it's choked out. Verse 8 of Luke 8 says, Other seed fell into the good soil, and it grew up, and it produced a crop a hundred times as great As he said these things, he would call out, he who has an ear, let him hear. So the the standard interpretation of this is only in the batch of soil that bears fruit do you have actual salvations. I don't think that's true at all. I think in three of the four soils, salvations happen. But the worries of this life choke the believer's maturity. That's what he's talking about. Someone is saved, justified, but they're not making any progress in the middle tense of their salvation. Rather than seeing only one of four saved, I think three of the four are saved. Certainly the salvation has occurred in the good soil, but according to our understanding, when does life begin? Doesn't life begin at conception? Well, spiritual life begins at conception. The moment there's birth, spiritual life has happened. And people start, need to start making a distinction between birth issues and growth issues. Those are two different things. You can be born and have maturity problems, nutrition problems, etc. That doesn't mean you're not born. And it's the exact same way in the spiritual life. You can be born again and not be growing the way you should. And just because you're not growing the way you should, that's a growth issue, a maturity issue. It is not necessarily a, the fact that a birth has never happened. That's how to understand those two other soils. So when you look at the interpretation of this, Luke 8, verses 12 through 15, it says, those beside the road are those who who have heard. The devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. Now, that first group there by the road, I'm on board with that. There's no salvations because it says they, they did not believe so as to be saved. But what about the rocky soil? Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. So these, these are, this is a situation where a conception has happened. Growth is coming up before it's stagnated through the cares of this world. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they uh, hear the word, receive with joy but they have no firm root. They believe for a while, so they did believe. See that? And in time of temptation, fall away. What happened to that group? There was an actual conception. There was an actual birth. But they didn't make progress in the middle tense of their salvation. This is describing someone not with a birth issue, but with a growth issue. See, the, the spurious faith idea assumes that people in that second group were unsaved. I'm saying they were saved, but they just didn't grow. Verse 14, the seed which fell among the thorns. 
Those are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life, but bring no fruit to maturity. See that? It's a maturity problem. That third group did believe, because it says back in verse seven, other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it. it there's growth. But as they were trying to live the Christian life, they weren't making progress. Maybe they weren't being discipled. Maybe they weren't reading their Bible. Maybe they weren't in prayer. And so they were stifled in the middle tense of their salvation. Verse 15, but the seed in, in the good soil... These are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold fast and bear fruit with perseverance. So the spurious faith idea is assuming that only people in that fourth batch of soil were saved. I'm saying it's completely legitimate interpretation to have people in the second group and the third group saved as well but they have not a birth issue, but they have a growth issue. They don't have a justification issue, they have a progressive sanctification issue. So that's a approach to the parable of the sowers that you, sower, excuse me, that you probably have never heard before. And just study it out for yourself and see if this could be a possibility because typically what you get today in Christendom is one interpretation three of the soils are unbelievers. And only that fourth soil is actually a believer. But if you believe that life begins at conception in the physical realm and in the spiritual realm, the, the, the sudden growth up before it's choked demonstrates spiritual life was there. So therefore, you cannot use Luke 8, verse 13, and James 2, verse 19, to somehow come in and argue that Simon's faith was not real. Simon didn't have a salvation problem. He had a growth problem. He did not have a justification problem. He had a discipleship problem. And of course, if you believe that there's the faith that saves and the faith that doesn't save, then you're gonna spend the rest of your life as a Christian looking at your salvation like the weather report. Hey, 30% chance of rain. Am I, am I gonna go to heaven one day? Ah, about a 30% chance. But then I have a really good week. Now it's up to 60%. And I have a lousy week. Now I'm down to 10% again. And you're kind of bouncing all over the place like a pinball in a pinball machine because you've been robbed of something that's your birthright, the assurance of your salvation. I mean, I know 100%, not 90%, not 95%, that when I die, I'm going to heaven. I have total and complete assurance of that. You know why I believe that? Because I'm kept by grace. That's how I know it. Now, if the whole thing rode on my shoulders, some days I would think I'm saved, other days I think I w wouldn't be saved. But I bounce back and forth in that issue because I have, a, in certain cases, a growth problem, a maturity problem. Am I gonna obey God and walk by faith when I hit a particular trial or not? That's not a salvation issue. Your performance as a Christian does not determine whether you're saved because you are got into the door by grace, right? Now, if you didn't get in the door by grace and you got in by works, or if you got in by faith but your works keep you, God help you. I mean, because one day you're gonna think you're saved, the next day you're gonna think you're not saved. I mean, it's no different than the unsurety of the weather report. What about this miracle faith idea? Oh, Simon just had miracle faith. Look very carefully at John 2, 23 through 25, where they're using the text they're using for this miracle faith idea. I read it earlier. 
Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in him, in, in his name, observing his signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them. So they say, well, these are people that just believed in miracles. They observed his signs. But if you look very carefully, they didn't just observe his signs, they believed in his name. But this passage is taught to me, and well, they just believed in miracles. So obviously their faith was illegitimate. That's why I have the, in brackets, the Greek construction that's used, translated, believed in. It's pastuo ace, believed in. And study that right on through John's Gospel. And what you will see is every single time where that Greek construction is used, it always refers to a person who is authentically born again. So you have to take the same construction, pastuo ace, and make this passage here kind of a special pleading. It's the same construction used in the purpose statement of John's gospel where John says, therefore many other signs Jesus performed also in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you might believe, pastuo ace, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. If pastuo ace meant that maybe your faith is illegitimate, then why is it in used in the purpose statement in John's gospel to convince people to get saved. It's the same Greek construction there that's used back in John 2. And miracle faith, Jesus wants us to have miracle faith. I mean, there's absolutely nothing wrong with believing in Jesus on account of the signs. The purpose statement in John's gospel is, therefore many other Signs Jesus performed in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. So actually Jesus is in favor of miracle faith because he invites faith based on his miracles which confirm who he is. So this whole sort of miracle faith versus real faith is just false. It's a false dichotomy. Uh, it's a false distinction. Now, watch this. If, if these people in John 2 believed in Christ and were really saved, which they were, because the pastuo ace construction is used here, why does it say Jesus would not entrust himself to them? I mean, does that, does that mean Jesus uh, is saying, well, you're really not saved? All you have to do is juxtapose John 2 with John 15, where Jesus starts to draw a distinction between being a believer in God and a friend of God. The whole thing is solved here in John 15, verses 14 and 15, where he says to his disciples, 11 saved people in the upper room. The only unbeliever Judas has left, John 13. So, so, so Jesus is talking to 11 saved people and now he starts to talk about something beyond being a believer. He's talking about being a friend of God. You are my friends if you, what's the next word? Do what I command. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. Hey, you believers, you 11 believers, you've graduated. You're no longer just a believer. You're now my friend. And the reason you're my friend is you have a walk of obedience. Now your walk of obedience doesn't qualify you for salvation. Faith alone does that. But the walk of obedience 
qualifies you for friendship with God. Well, why would I want to be a friend of God? Because God makes disclosures to you that he doesn't make to believers who aren't his friends, disobedient believers. You are my friends if you do what I command. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. Hey, I've been with you guys, 11 believers, for three years now. And I'm seeing a walk of obedience. So guess what? You're no longer just believers. You're still that, praise the Lord, but you're also my friends. And because you're my friends, you're entitled to disclosures of insight that other believers are not exposed to. So you have to learn to draw a distinction between salvation and friendship, two different things. What is the condition of salvation? Faith by itself. What is the condition for friendship? Obedience. What's the key scripture on salvation? John 3:16. What's the key scripture on friendship? John 15 verse 14. Of the three phases of salvation, justification, sanctification, and glorification, which one does salvation deal with? Justification, being made right with God. What phase of salvation does friendship deal with? Sanctification, growth. Friendship with God is a growth issue, not a salvation issue. Well, what's the benefit of salvation? Saved from sin's penalty. What's the benefit of being a friend of God as demonstrated through a walk of obedience? You now have insight into things, as Jesus said would happen, John 15, verses 14 and 15, that the, the average believer who's not yet really learned the walk of discipleship is not, does not receive. So all friends of God are believers, but not all believers are friends of God. See that? Now once you get solidified in that way of thinking, John 2, verses 23 through 25 is not hard to interpret. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, Pastuo Ace, observing his signs, which Jesus invited, which he was doing. So these are people that are clearly justified. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. When it says he didn't entrust himself to them, what he's saying is this group here that's believed in me has not learned the walk of obedience yet. They've not learned the walk of discipleship yet, so they are not my friends yet, because there's no pattern of obedience in, in their lives. They're just baby Christians. They don't know anything about discipleship or obedience. So I will not entrust myself to them with greater disclosures and insight. The greater disclosures and insight go to my friends. So I'm gonna wait for these people here to grow up, put on the big boy pants, Get rid of the training wheels, man up, become a disciple, and as they do that one by one, I'll start entrusting myself to them as my friends because they have a walk of obedience. See that? So if you understand this correctly, he's, <laughs> there, there's no um, spurious faith doctrine here. There's one faith. You either believe in Christ or you don't. The issue with these people is not whether they have the right kind of faith. The issue is, are they going to become God's friend or not through obedience? That's the issue. And once you see that, it, it totally dissolves the idea that I'm going to say, 
Simon is not a true believer because of John 2. Well, John 2 isn't even talking about so-called spurious faith. John 2 is drawing a distinction between believer and friendship. How about this third argument? Well, Peter tells him to repent. You only tell an unbeliever to repent, right? You never tell a believer to repent, do you? I mean, you, you, all, you guys are all believers. You ever had to repent of something as a believer? I have. I mean, this idea that repentance only applies to an unsaved person, it's like, my goodness, have you not read Revelation 2 and 3? Uh, written to the seven churches. He's believing churches. He tells them to repent, 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 repent all the way through those letters. And in fact, what's the worst of those churches? What's the worst? They're all, they're all bad except for two. That's why when I was driving my car not long ago, I saw a church sign that said, we are a first century church. And I thought, oh no. Which one, Laodicea? I don't know. I don't know if I would want to be a first century church. We're the first church of Corinth. That's something to be proud of. Well, the worst of the worst is Laodicea. I mean, they're like the bottom of the barrel. Jesus doesn't even have anything good to say about Laodicea. At least with the other ones, he's able to muster a few compliments. Nothing good going on in Laodicea. Yet the Laodiceans are saved. How do I know that? Because of verse 19, written to the church at Laodicea. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. See that? The concept of discipline does not apply to the unsaved. Judgment applies to the unsaved. Discipline is a totally different idea. Whom the Lord loves, the Lord what? Chastens. I have never disciplined the neighbor's kids, although it's been tempting at times. But you discipline your own. In fact, Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 13 says if we experience the disciplining hand of God, it proves we belong, that we're one of his children. So here he's talking about discipline to Laodicea, which is the worst of the worst. So if the worst of the worst are saved, all the rest of them are saved too. And all the way through, he says, repent, 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 repent. Not repent unto salvation, they already had that, but repent according to certain sins happening in these churches. So this idea, I don't know where people really come up with this stuff, but this idea that somehow repentance only applies to unbelievers, I mean, that's just a ridiculous idea. You have to throw out Revelation 2 and 3 to get that to work. What about this fourth argument, perish? Going back to Acts 8, verse 20. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. So they say perish means you go into hell. But that's kind of interesting because silver can't perish, can it? So it must mean something else. I think what it's talking about is, Simon, if you don't get your act together and, and start experiencing mental renewal, Romans 12, verse 2, then there are things in your life that of a temporal nature that will perish. Ministry opportunities will perish. Rewards at the Bema Seat judgment of Christ will perish. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 through 15 talks about a man whose life, not his life, but his works go through the fire at the Bema Seat and it's all consumed. But he himself is saved, yet is through fire. So here's a man who did experience perishing. He didn't perish. 
but the reward that he could have had had he invested his life rightly perished at the Bema Seat judgment. Paul was concerned about this. He said, I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. And the prize is not salvation or else Paul just taught work salvation. When he talks about being disqualified for the prize, he's talking about a fear of losing reward at the Bama seat after having preached to others. See, as a Christian, you can go out and be disobedient if you want to. And although because of once saved, always saved, and you're kept by grace, although you may not perish, a lot of things in your life will. Not the least of which is rewards at the Bama seat. Second John 8, watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but you may receive a full reward. There's, there's a reward perishing. Revelation 3, verse 11, to the church at Philadelphia, I am coming quickly, hold fast to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Oh, look, they're gonna lose their salvation. No, the crown is reward. Above and beyond salvation. C Christians lose things constantly by being disobedient to God that have nothing to do with one's glorification, which is already a done deal. How about this argument here? A uh, Simon looks like an unsaved person. Well, how much time had Simon had, had to grow before he was rebuked by Peter? Like five minutes? What kind of Bible study program was he on? What local church did he attend? I mean, he had no time for any of that. So that's why he's not doing well in the middle tense of his salvation here, where Peter's rebuke to him is very strong. Growth is a process, just like in the natural world. You have to avail your mind to the things of God constantly to grow. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. That's a process that takes time. Justification in a nanosecond. Growth is a process. Conception in the physical world, nanosecond. Growth and maturity is a process. Simon had no time to grow. That's why he's acting like an unsaved person because that's the way his mind is, was working prior to the process of mental renewal. How about this argument here? Simon never received the Holy Spirit. Well, that's an argument from silence. I mean, the text doesn't say everybody got the Holy Spirit except Simon. Doesn't say that either. He was baptized though. Philip thought he was legit. And how about this last argument here? He was the founder of Gnosticism. Well, you know what, folks? The devil can use a saved person. Peter, was Peter saved? Hello? Yes, okay. Just want to make sure with the right crowd here. No doubt Peter was saved. Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Satan. I mean, just because someone's life is used for satanic purposes doesn't mean they're not saved. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 to the believer says, be angry, do not sin, do not let the sin go down in your anger, lest you give the devil an opportunity. Were Ananias and Sapphira saved? Yeah. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie? Just because... Simon went on and was the founder, perhaps, of some kind of false religion. Doesn't necessarily mean he was unsaved. Satan uses saved people all the time if they pander to the flesh. How about this statement here? Who said it? 
First, their synagogue should be set on fire. Secondly, their homes should likewise be broken down and destroyed. Thirdly, they should be deprived of their prayer books and Talmuds. Fourthly, their rabbis must be forbidden under threat of death to teach anymore. Fifthly, passport and traveling privileges should be absolutely forbidden to the Jews. Sixthly, they ought to be stopped from usury, charging interest on loans. Don't look at the bottom of the screen if you still want to play who said it. Seventh, <laughs> let the young and strong Jews and Jewesses be given the flail, the axe, the hoe, the spade, the distaff, the spindle, and let them earn their bread by the sweat of their noses. We ought to drive their lazy bones out of our system. Therefore, away with them to sum up dear princes and nobles who have Jews in your domains. If this advice of mine does not suit you, then find a better one so that you and we may be free of this unsuffer unsufferable devilish burden the Jews, close quote. Who said it? Martin Luther, the leader of the Protestant Reformation. A man that God used, but he got grumpy and angry at the end of his life. And he got frustrated with the Jews and Satan used him when he pandered to the, the flesh. Why couldn't the same thing have happened to Simon? So when verse 13 says, even Simon believed, I take that as, I take it for what it says. He was authentically saved. And so we'll pick it up with the rest of verse 13 next time. So we covered verse 13a today. Congratulations. Father, we're grateful for your word, your truth. Help us to handle it correctly in this area of, of salvation. Thank you for the grace that you've given us. Thank you also for the opportunity to grow into Christ's likeness so we can qualify for friendship and reward at the Bema Seat. Make us people, Lord, that are not just believers, but those that are disciples. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. If you got to take off, now's a good time to do it, especially since